Welcome to the preaching ministry of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church of Chattanooga. This recording is simply the sermon portion of our worship service. To experience our full worship service, we encourage you and invite you to join us Sunday morning at 11 in our beautiful sanctuary located at 1505 North Moore Road. On October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg. Now, if he were living today, he would have posted them online somewhere. His whole goal was not to start a whole new branch of the church, but to reform the church, to bring grace back to the church. And so we celebrate oftentimes this time of year Reformation Sunday, and that is what we are doing today. Not only celebrating Martin Luther and him bringing grace, bringing the scripture, bringing faith uh, back to the people, but also the ongoing Reformation both in our churches and, our, and in our hearts that should always be happening. And so let me share with you from the book of Ephesians, the second chapter, one of those passages that struck Martin Luther so strongly when he was seeking to find the grace of God. Paul writes, You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love from which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. And this, brothers and sisters, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When blazoned over the gates of Auschwitz, the Nazi death camp, were the words and the lie, Arbeit macht frei, or work sets you free. Those same words and lies could be emblazoned over the gates to hell, even the gates to hell on earth. For neither the Nazi captors nor the demons in hell are interested in one bit in our freedom, but only in what they can wring out of their victims. I can work as hard as I can. I tell I can no longer work anymore and I will not be set free, but instead my captors will simply dispose of me and that is precisely what sparked Martin Luther to accidentally begin the Protestant Reformation the church you see had fallen into the work sets you free lie and Martin Luther wanted to reform it you're probably aware that one of his great concerns was that the church was selling indulgences and indulgences were going to pay to restore the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome if you had a friend or a relative and who had passed away and they were in purgatory, uh, you could buy an indulgence, offer that good work, offering to, to, to help uh, rebuild the basilica a little bit, and that good work would allow them to be released from purgatory. When the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs is what they said. And yet you can hear in that, work sets you free. You do a good work, pay to restore a church, and you are setting free a relative or a friend or even yourself. Martin Luther was a very earnest monk. By 1517, he was already a doctor of the church, and his study had led him to want to be able to earn the righteousness, to earn the holiness, to earn the favor and the love of God. And yet he realized 
He couldn't think himself into earning the uh, love of God. And he couldn't work himself into earn, um, earning the love of God. And he recognized that the church couldn't sell it to him either. It's not that he was terribly immoral, but it's also that he also wasn't terribly holy. And that passage in Romans, that verse, that all have fallen short of the glory of God, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, he just was so aware of that in his life. And it tortured him until he discovered grace in passages like that passage in Ephesians I just read for you. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's not your own works, but it is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one might boast. One of the primary concerns that Martin Luther in his doctoral work had for the church was that the church had essentially adopted the philosophy of Aristotle, the, the great but pagan philosopher, instead of adopting the philosophy and the theology of Scripture. Aristotle believed that all humans were striving towards the good and, and with enough good work and enough intention we could make our way toward the good. And there is something to be said for that. And yet the problem was that, that Aristotle essentially used an image of parents and children thinking theologically. All parents have as their goal, at least good parents, that their children will eventually become independent of them. We kind of want to have the empty nest and we find ways to encourage and, and to sometimes cajole our children to develop physically and intellectually and spiritually and vocationally so that at some time they can leave the nest and start a life of their own. And by definition then they have to be somewhat independent of us. And Aristotle essentially saw the same thing. The better we get, the more independent we are of God, the less we need of God. And Martin Luther saw the impossibility of this. He saw that this analogy does not work with God. As a matter of fact, he said that uh, the more holy we become under this system, the less we would need of Jesus. And that simply cannot be. That's simply another form of work sets you free. Now, that's not just heady theology. It actually leads us to the gates of hell, both in this life and after. You see, many critics of the church uh, somewhat correctly claim that sometimes we are holier than thou. We pretend to be less sinful than those outside of the church. And we may even believe, perhaps unconsciously, that our growth in faith is due to our own works, our own intelligence, our own strength. We forget that the grace we are given is given to us as a gift, not as something that we can earn, not something that we can generate. And oftentimes when we begin to believe that somehow it was our own work, our own intelligence that, that brought us to this spot, then we begin to look down on others. Again, it may be unconscious, but we see ourselves, because we are Christians, as somehow smarter, as somehow less sinful or more holy or, or better than other people when none of those things are true. There's actually interesting scientific evidence, although it is rather humbling, because uh, I bet you will see yourself in it. I certainly can see myself in it. That we humans tend to believe that when good stuff happens to us, it happens to us because we deserve it. But when good stuff happens to other people, particularly good stuff that we wish would happen to us, we tend to think that, well, they're just lucky. Or maybe even they found some immoral way to get it. And it works on the flip side as well. When something bad happens to me, I'm likely to be believe that it happened to me simply because uh, it was forces that were beyond my control that caused it to happen to me. But if something bad happens to you, ah... I'm going to suggest perhaps that maybe you deserve it. You hear in that natural human tendency, work sets you free. If I work hard enough, I'll get good stuff. But if you work hard enough, maybe you're just being lucky. Maybe that's not at all. That's a lie. It's a lie that we tell about ourselves and a lie that we tell about others. But here's the truth. Grace doesn't make us less sinful it doesn't make us smarter. It doesn't make us better than others. It may free us from our sins, but it does not free us from the propensity to sin. And it does not make us less sinful. And it certainly does not make us better than other people. Martin Luther put it this way, although I'm paraphrasing it into a little more modern English. We are simultaneously sinner and saint 100% of the time. 
Because we are always in need of the grace of God that can then transform us. But even in the transformation, we still need grace. Now, I know this still may all sound heady, so let me use a different illustration. Not the parent and child, because that one doesn't work. We never will be independent of God. We never will need less of Jesus or less of grace. So let us think of grace rather like we think of food. What would you say to me if I announced to you that I had decided that I am going to become food independent? I've been eating food for 56 years now. It's time that I be independent of food. Think how much money I spend on food, how much time I spend on food, on, on cooking food and eating food and even just thinking about food. If I were food independent, how much greater my life would be. And so I am now going to be food independent. No more food for me. Well, you would likely at uh, best perhaps say, well, let's see how that works out for you. And at worst, maybe try to find some place to commit me for my insanity. I can't just declare that I am food independent any more than I could declare that I am now grace independent. I've got all that I need. We never grow out of the need for grace any more than we can grow out of the need for food. And so the only chance that I have to be the person that Christ wants me to be and needs me to be, is to daily, just as I daily eat, daily experience the grace of Christ, take the grace of Christ into me. How wonderful it is that when we come to the table to eat, we don't come with our heads down admitting how uh, shameful it is that we are so weak that we have to eat two or three or more times a day. But rather we tend to come to the table with great expectation, particularly if, if the food that is there is something that we enjoy. Yes, sitting at the table is an indication of our need. I cannot go for very long without food, not more than a few weeks at best. Uh, and the longer I go without food, the weaker I am. But when I come to the table, it isn't in, in shame for my need, but it rather is in gratitude for the fact that my need is being met. Grace is the same way. Yes, sin is shameful, and we are need, in need of grace because of our sin. But we come to the feast table that Christ sets for us, not because we come uh, uh, in great shame, but rather we come knowing that Christ is going to take care of that need. And the feast that Christ gives to us is the fruit of the Spirit. That is the feast, the wonderful fruit, love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. All of those wonderful things we get to feast on. And Christ sets that table for us each and every day. And we sometimes talk about we get hangry. I'm so hungry, I'm angry. And when we get hungry, we do get irritable, don't we? When we get hungry, our need is not merely physical. It begins to become intellectual and emotional, even spiritual. Being hungry drives us away from who we really want to be. And I can't just will my way out of being hangry. I have to sit down at the table likewise with grace. Paul tells us in Colossians that these are the ways that you once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Well, that sounds like being hangry, doesn't it? Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive language from your mouth. When we get rid of grace, when we say, well, I got grace when I was nine years old and I accepted Christ and, and I don't need grace anymore, what's going to bubble up in our lives is all of that hangry stuff because we are hungry and not for food but hungry for grace. And so we accept the gift of grace as we accept the gift of food. That which gives us the nourishment and the sustenance that we need to be able to be the people that we are called to be. When I'm hangry and I sit down to a good meal and I eat the good meal, uh, the, the angry just takes care of itself. The hangry just takes care of itself. I eat the meal and I am satisfied and the, the anger, the hangry part goes away. Likewise, when we experience the feast that Christ sets before us. And so on this Reformation Sunday, let us do away with the lie that our bite mocked fry, that work sets us free. Let us do away with the lie that, that we only need to experience grace one time and that is sufficient, but rather recognize that we must live our lives always daily coming to the table that Christ has set for us, the feast table, that we might experience and accept His grace 
And then that we might be set free, not by our works, but by the gift of God that we might not boast. And then we will be the people of grace that God wants us to be and that we want to be. And to that end, will you join me in a word of prayer? Let us pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you for Martin Luther, for rediscovering grace and for offering grace to us. But even more, we thank you for Jesus Christ, who ever and ever has offered grace to his children. Help us come to his feast table this day and every day. Let us feast on his word. Let us feast on his presence. Let us feast on all that he wants to give to us. And we pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this message from the preaching ministry of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Once more, we hope you'll join us in person Sunday at 11 a.m. for worship.